In this program, the project scientist of the Viking missions to Mars, Dr. Gerald Soffen, tells why the missions were so important in the study of the Red Planet. I was the Viking project scientist. It was the job that was similar to the conductor of an orchestra. I gathered together the 70 scientists formed on 13 teams and was sort of the transparent window through which uh, the project viewed the scientists and the scientists viewed the project. The job was to make sure that the kind of science that we were doing on Mars was the kind of which the nation and NASA was proud and to make sure that the project understood what those scientific requirements were. At the same time, it was to portray to those scientists the actual requirements and the limitations that the project would put on it, the power limitations, the data limitations, the, the kind of things that uh, only could be done by a group of engineers. Uh, my job was to adjudicate the various priorities, to try to separate what one team wanted and what another team wanted, to use the resources of the project in the best possible way. The goal of the Viking Project was the exploration of Mars. Now, we had had missions that went to Mars before, but the goal of, of the Viking was to land spacecraft on the surface and actually explore in situ what Mars was like. It was like being on Mars. We actually had uh, experiments that one would do if one of us were lucky enough to be landed on, on the planet and dug up handfuls of Mars and had a little laboratory there. It was fundamentally what, what Viking was all about. Uh, we used two spacecraft to do that. We had a spacecraft that was a lander and a spacecraft that was an orbiter. It was kind of like a mother and a daughter. The mother was the one that received the information and did a little investigation on its own. And the lander was uh, primarily used to, to do the kinds of things that if we were having a field trip on Mars, we would have sent uh, an exploration party out to Mars to do that kind of experiment. They involved meteorology, they involved biology, they involved chemistry, they involved uh, geology. Uh, of course, the biology was a predominant, predominant question that we had because that was uh, the kind of the bell ringer. But nevertheless, the, the whole point of the Viking was to explore in breadth what Mars was, was like and how similar or how different it is from the Earth. The, the Viking spacecraft consisted of two parts. An orbiter that was placed into orbit around Mars that carried the daughter ship that was then allowed to descend to the surface of the planet. The orbiter consisted of a, a large spacecraft with uh, very large solar panels so that it could uh, absorb the sun's energy, convert it into electrical power, and be run. The orbiter was placed into an elliptical orbit around Mars. The periapsis of the planet was, was about 1,500 kilometers. The apapsis of the orbit was put in about 30,000 kilometers. Imagine this orbiter now passing over a landing site with a distance of about 1,500 kilometers trying to take pictures of a landing site that was uh, later going to be going to be used for the, the daughter ship. The lander, which was folded up like a chrysalis of a butterfly, uh, would be later landed by descending to the surface. Uh, the descent to the surface was tricky because the Mars atmosphere was just thin enough to burn you up and not thick enough to, to slow you down. And so there was this unique problem of a landing system that wasn't just uh, a a parachute. In fact, we had three braking systems on Mars. Uh, once down into the Mars atmosphere, a parachute was popped. Now, this was no ordinary parachute. This was a parachute that had to, to slow the spacecraft down at, at Mach, uh, at about Mach 4. The parachute got us down to within about 100 kilometers, and then a retro rocket system was used. The retro rockets were firing their rockets down against the Mars surface to slowly slow the spacecraft down in combination with a, a radar that would tell us how far we were from the surface and allow this spacecraft to descend to the surface, the very last moments would be like jumping off a small table so that you'd settle down onto the Mars atmosphere and protect those valuable scientific instruments from, from a crash. One of the most interesting and perhaps uh, uh, exciting parts prior to getting the data back was the selection and certification of the landing site. And there's an interesting surprise ending to this story. Uh, we spent two years trying to decide, first of all, which hemisphere to land in Mars. Did we want a winter Mars or did we want a summer Mars? We knew about the time that we would get there. And of course, it was summer in the northern hemisphere and winter in the southern hemisphere. The other thing was uh, to try to decide what kind of a landing site. Did we want a landing site that had geological changes 
or was it really a landing site that was a adapted to biology? Since biology was such a sensitive issue on, on Viking, uh, the biologists, uh, I would say, kind of ruled the roost in this thing. What they ideally wanted was a, a, a low, warm, wet spot. Low because it would have a chance of, if there was any liquid water on Mars. Now, today, it's easy to remember back and think that there wasn't any, any liquid water on Mars. But remember, back in 1975, there was always that possibility that we might find some open pools of water. Uh, they wanted a warm spot, a place that, that, if there was any life, would probably, uh, uh, probably conjure up the idea of a, of a nice, uh, comfortable place for life. And thirdly, they wanted a, a place where uh, there was some evidence of, of water in the atmosphere. And so the biologists uh, prevailed on the project to try to find, the, to find a landing site that was adapted to those biological conditions. And of course, we had to find a landing site that you could actually select uh, samples from. From the point of view of the project, there was one central thing. Find a place that was safe. Find some place, after all, this spacecraft was about the size, the lander was about the size of a Volkswagen, a small, compact car. And to try to land the spacecraft in a place among rocks, and we rem remember we didn't know that there wasn't large boulders on, on Mars. And in fact, there are large boulders on Mars. So there was a great hazard of putting this bird down in a, in a parking lot uh, where there was an unpaved parking lot, someplace that on, on Mars would be safe. And there was back and forth arguments between the scientists and the project, should we, should we pick this place, should we pick that place? We were after a kind of lunar-like terrain, I mean, lunar-like in the sense of nice rolling sand dunes that were, were there, or we hoped would, would be there. As it turns out, and we went through a long certification period where, where from the orbiter, uh, once the orbiter was injected into the, into the orbit around Mars, uh, about the middle of June of 1976, it would look down and try to see what the landing site was like. Now remember, the, the, uh, the ability to see is prescribed by the distance away from the planet, so it didn't have very good, we use the term, resolution. We could see things about the size of a building. Now, you can't land a spacecraft among boulders the size of a building, so we were looking for very smooth places hoping that there would be no big rocks that were, were there to kind of stumble over. Uh, the surprise came when, in fact, we tried to certify the landing site and couldn't. We really did not certify that landing site. If anything, we found out the landing site was exactly the opposite of what we wanted. Instead of finding nice, smooth uh, sand dunes, what we found was giant chasms and giant, giant uh, uh, cliffs and big mountains and so forth in the place that we had originally picked. There was panic in the streets in Viking. There was, I remember that night when those first pictures came in and our faces were all drawn. How do you get a lander down among all those jagged cliffs? And so we had to pick another landing site. Now the selection of that new landing site was, was timed uh, by another spacecraft. We had a second orbiter that was on its way to Mars and the orbit of that second spacecraft would, deter would be determined by where the first spacecraft went. So we had a round-the-clock meeting. It was the longest meeting in, in the history of the space program. From the time that we knew that we couldn't land on Mars, we had basically one three-week meeting, 24 hours a day, people coming into the meeting, people leaving the meeting, and selected the landing site based upon some of those pictures that were found. In fact, one of the more interesting aspects was the fact that when we changed the landing site, we looked for indicators of where a safe site would be. There were indications of dark markings on the surface of Mars. The dark markings suggested that winds had laid down material on the surface of Mars. And one suggestion was to follow the dark markings in the hopes that you would find sand dunes, or I should say the orbiter would find sand dunes lying somewhere on Mars. And if we could find where those kind of indicators, pointers towards a safe landing site might be, that that would be a safe, safe place. Uh, that was done, and uh, that's what gave us uh, our first landing site. As soon as the lander was down onto the surface, uh, there were two things done. One, the well-being of the spacecraft. Think about you're trying to land some kind of an instrument anywhere. First thing to do is to make sure that the system is working, elevates the, the antenna to talk back to the Earth, uh, takes uh, measurement, temperature measurements to make sure that the spacecraft is all right, a kind of housekeeping maneuver. Then the most, uh, the most important piece of scientific data to come back would be the first picture. And the very first picture pointed down to the 
the foot pad to make sure that, that the, the instruments were stable, that the spacecraft was stable, and also to see what the Martian surface was like. I will never forget that first evening when we first saw the first pictures coming back bit by bit, line by line, sweeping across the Mars surface and seeing for the first time that it was a surface that was familiar, familiar in the sense that it looked a little bit like, like some pictures we've seen of the Earth, and that it wasn't like the moon at all. There were rocks in the surface. There were, there were features to the surface. We didn't get a horizon until the second picture. But the first picture was just to say, it's sort of like looking down at your own foot. Uh, if you stepped onto a brand new planet and said, what is it like on this planet? The Martian weather was much more extreme than the kind of weather we find on Earth. The temperature on Mars oscillates between very cold, uh, sub-zero every night, and uh, temperatures that come to about the temperature of, of room temperature here on the Earth. Uh, the winds on Mars are very intense during some parts of the season. Uh, there are overcast clouds during a Martian storm. The winds change direction from each time of the day the Mars weather is determined by the pressure, the temperature, and the, the physics of the surface. There are dust storms that occur every two years on Mars and cause uh, dramatic changes on the surface of Mars. Winds change directions daily. One might even think about Martian climate. Is there a change over the long period of time? Now, Viking only looked at Mars for uh, a brief period in, in Mars history, a few years. Uh, and so we really don't know much about Martian climate. But by looking at the surface, we can see erosion and know that the weather must have been considerably different in ancient times than the weather is today. From the point of view of the biologist, we never knew what we were going to find on Mars. The possibility of microbial life or plant life, uh, uh, those were all in the minds of many people. Not many people expected to find higher organisms. We didn't expect to find fully developed things. After all, Mars uh, is known to be uh, much more docile in, in the sense of didn't have water and so forth. But if there was anything we thought perhaps maybe lichens or maybe uh, some sort of low creatures, a microorganism of some, some sort, to find a fully, a full-blown plant, well, that was, uh, that was in, the, in the realm of or perhaps wild conjecture. It wasn't out of the question, but it was still conjecture. Uh, the primary experiments, though, were looking for very low forms of primitive organisms in their first stages of evolution, something perhaps that was going on in the Earth uh, three or four billion years ago. There were really three life detection experiments. While collectively they, they interacted with one another, uh, there were really three different experiments that were done. And perhaps I'll say something about the fourth experiment. Uh, the first experiment was, was one done to look for photosynthesis, to look for the ability of an organism, a Martian organism in this case, to use the sun's energy to actually make organic material. We call these plants on, on the Earth. Now, of course, I don't know what you would call them on Mars, but was that process of photosynthesis something that we would be likely to see? Uh, the experiment was done using a radioisotope tracer. In this case, it was carbon dioxide, uh, which is what plants take up here on the Earth. But the carbon had carbon-14, uh, a kind of radioactive carbon that would be used as a tracer to find out whether, in fact, that carbon dioxide was taken up by the Martian organism, if there were going to be any Martian, organis Martian organisms there. The CO2 was taken to Mars. We had that carbon-14 from the Earth here with a radioactive tracer on it. And instead of using the Martian sunlight, we wanted to guarantee that we had a sunlight that we understood. So we took our own little kind of sunlight in the form of a bulb. We picked up a sample of the Mars surface, illuminated with the, with the light, uh, gave it the carbon dioxide, and looked for the ability of that sample to pick up the carbon dioxide and, uh, and transform it into organic material. Uh, that experiment to this day still remains somewhat controversial because the very first time we did it, we got a very modest positive signal. And at the time, it looked like uh, maybe we had detected life on Mars. Well, as it turns out, most people, most biologists believe that that first result was, was an anomaly. We repeated that experiment many, many times and never again was able to get a signal like that first one.
was it something that we that we really saw and that that uh, that was life but weren't able to repeat, or was it just an anomaly, a peculiarity of the instrument, a peculiarity of the sample, something about the way it was done? Scientists are very careful to want to be able to repeat things before they begin to believe results. The second life detection experiment, called the label release experiment, also used this very clever technique of a radioisotope label. In this case, the carbon was put into a kind of media, a kind of growth media. Uh, and, and they were simple chemicals like sugars. Uh, we We'll give them scientific names, formate, and glycine, and glucose. Uh, those things were, those chemicals were used to inoculate a small sample that was taken from the surface of Mars. In this case, we were looking for metabolic products. We were looking for the ability of the Martian organisms, if there were any, to take in these nutrients and breathe out the kind of gases, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide or some other gas, and transform that carbon from the carbon in the organic material into kind of an exhaust gas. Kind of like taking a Geiger counter and examining your breath after you'd had a, a little sugar in, in your body and it would breathe out the carbon di as carbon dioxide. In that case, uh, the results were, again, a little bit ambiguous because we did get a signal, but it was nothing like the kind of signal that we would expect from a, a real biological organism. It was the kind of signal that you get if you had a, a strange chemical reaction on the surface of Mars. In a third experiment that we kind of laughingly called the chicken soup experiment, we actually tried to grow some organisms. We took a mixture of uh, delicious terrestrial ingredients, so all sorts of vitamins and minerals and extracts and amino acids and sugars and all the goodies that you would use if you were going to uh, grow up some organisms. And the idea was to inoculate the sample with these goodies. Now in the experiment, we had a novel uh, first stage before we actually inoculated the sample we wanted to humidify it. Some terrestrial organisms that form spores are known to die as a result of the ingestion of water. So the idea is to do what we do with spore formers on the Earth. We first humidify, just expose it to water, and then finally grow up the organisms. In the case of that experiment, we had a great surprise. Instead of the first humidification having no result, which was what we would see here on, on Earth, we saw enormous quantities of oxygen that came out of the sample. Uh, for reasons that at the time were very confusing to us, we saw this release of oxygen, not at all what you'd find here on the, on the Earth. Finally, after some thought, we figured out what that oxygen was. We finally figured out that Mars, the surface of Mars, has some peroxides as though there were kind of bleach or something spilled on the surface. Uh, these were a little like uh, hydrogen peroxide, although there's no hydrogen peroxide on Mars. It's probably iron peroxide. A peroxide is something that is known to give up oxygen. And when you add water to a peroxide, this oxygen is released. A kind of uh, self-sterilizing surface in a way. Uh, we don't know that that's the fact on Mars, but that's a possibility. And in fact, it explains what happened in the second experiment. In the second experiment where we had added the growth media, probably what happened is the peroxide on Mars reacted with the growth media and released some of the carbon dioxide as though it were being broken down by organisms, a kind of chemical reaction. So in fact, the two experiments blended together so that the results of the third gas exchange experiment uh, told us something about the answer to the second, the label release experiment. I'd like to say a few words about another important result from uh, the Mars experiments. Uh, one of the things that we were trying to do was understand something about the nature of the organic material on the surface of Mars. Organic compounds are familiar to all of us. Organic compounds are things that will burn, things that smell, things that are volatile, 
Gasoline's an organic compound. You're an organic compound. Wood is an organic compound. We have found organic compounds in the meteorites that come here to Earth. If, if we take a meteorite and cut it in half, we can literally smell the organics that are inside those meteorites. We knew there were meteorites landing on Mars because Mars is near the asteroid belt, which is the source of all these meteorites. Our question was going to be, are the organic compounds on Mars, do they come from meteorites? Or did they, did they come from organisms on Mars? Or did they grow out of kind of a chemical reaction that was taking place on Mars? So the instrument that we send, a very complicated instrument called a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, scientific instrument, was going to look for very small amounts of organic chemicals on Mars. To our astonishment, we found no organics on Mars, none. The instrument was sensitive, almost as sensitive as your nose is, was sensitive to uh, a part per billion, that is one part in a billion parts of organic compounds would be detected on the surface of Mars. The first time that we looked at the sample results, we didn't believe we had a sample. We believed maybe the instrument had malfunctioned. And so we repeated the experiment many, many times. And still, to this day, we believe that there is no organic compounds anywhere near those sites that we landed in. It is possible that the areas that we landed in are unique and that some other region of Mars has organic compounds. For example, maybe the poles of Mars have organic compounds. Maybe material from the atmosphere, the volatiles from the atmosphere, are actually frozen out at the poles, that they're condensed at the poles, and that there really are some organics on Mars, but one would have to go up to the polar regions to find those. Most biologists today, combining the results of the organic analysis and the biological results, believe that in those landing sites, uh, there probably are no life today. In the future, I believe what, what is going to happen is the next missions to Mars, whether it's the Soviets or the Americans, will be orbiting Mars again, uh, probably landing again, and I hope roving, roving on the surface of Mars, an unmanned uh, exploration of the surface with a, with a robot, something like what the Soviets did on the moon, a, a kind of lunacod, or an American version of the lunacod, roving on the surface, uh, and maybe uh, combined with the mission to return samples to Mars. We'd love to have some of those samples back into laboratories, and perhaps it would be a mission that uh, is sent to Mars to return, return those samples. We have to take precautions to make sure that we don't contaminate the Earth with, with some of the Mars things, but that's, of course, within our, our current technology. Uh, in fact, there's been some suggestion that possibly we and the Soviets could combine a mission where one nation sends the, the mission to go to Mars and gather up the samples, and the other mission, the other country sends a mission to go to Mars and take those samples and return them, maybe to a space station here on, on the Earth. Eventually, we're going to want to have humans explore Mars, and eventually humans live on Mars. The real benefits of having humans on Mars are just like uh, sending humans to the field here, to the field tests. Uh, one could set up all sorts of stations in the forests, in the oceans, in the atmosphere uh, to gather information, but only when humans are actually there and can see for themselves do they recognize the surprises, do they understand the relationships of various experiments, it's wonderful in an exploratory period to have robots to do our work. But until we, we, we have explorers in those places, we'll not be able to fathom the real depth of it. Finally, I suspect that uh, we nations of the world, probably not Americans by that time or even Soviets, uh, will want a, a colony on Mars, a real colony of, of people whose, whose lives, a portion of their lives, are committed to live on Mars. Mars Getting to Mars won't be the, the long adventure that it is today. It will be much more conventional, like going to Europe or, or maybe in 10 years going to the moon again. Uh, people will be going to Mars to conduct uh, parts of their lives, to perhaps, uh, besides explore, exploring Mars, to perform um, major, major human endeavors on the surface of Mars. And we will be transformed, as, as were our ancestors transformed from a uh, from a group of Europeans who came to this country as adventurers and explorers into people who live here. Eventually, I think humans will, 
be transformed from the surface of the R. Eventually, humans would be transformed from the surface of the Earth to the surface of Mars as another place in the solar system. When the first settlers began to tame the North American continent, few could have imagined the tremendous changes that were to take place over the next few centuries. By settling new places in our solar system, the human race may continue to expand our realm of knowledge and opportunity. In our next two programs, Dr. Carl Sagan moderates a panel discussion that examines why it is important that we go to Mars and how we might achieve it. Please join us. Until then, this is Lynn Bondurant saying goodbye from the NASA Lewis Research Center. <laughs>